Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players and featuring Amzie Strickland as Sergeant Betty Krupke. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail the Women's Army Corps. Our story is entitled when the clock strikes. This is the story about a woman who enlisted and is still serving her country as a member of the Women's Army Corps. After this important message, our first act curtain will rise. Love and loyalty to our country have never been the exclusive attributes of men. And throughout our nation's history, women have given indisputable evidence of their devotion. Now more than ever before, the services of women are urgently needed to undertake hundreds of jobs that are available in the Women's Army Corps. So why not get an early start with a job that gives you the feeling of being of real service to your country? You'll enjoy that feeling in the Women's Army Corps, and you'll be doing a job that will be a little different every day. You'll be getting the finest specialized training in the world in the career field in which you are best qualified. So don't let this opportunity pass you by. Remember, Today, young women between the ages of 18 and 34 can best serve their nation by working side by side with the men of the services. So if you want to share in the defense of the American way of life, join the Women's Army Corps now. Stop in at your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and learn how you can serve best in the modern Women's Army Corps. And now, with Amzie Strickland in the role of Sergeant Krupke, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, When the Clock Strikes. Let me tell you a little secret about the newspaper game. Something I learned the hard way. You can knock yourself out trying to land a good story, trying to beat all the other sheets with a scoop. Yeah, you can whittle yourself down to nothing, pounding the streets and asking questions, poking your nose into everybody's business. And you may end up with a story. Chances are, though, you won't. The story you want to write, the story that you think is important, a lot of times is right there at the end of your nose, only you're too busy being front page to recognize it. That's how it was with the series I'm writing now. I didn't shake down any authorities looking for it. I didn't have to dig into old filing cabinets and trunks. The series was handed to me lock, stock, and barrel by a slim, brown-eyed girl in an army uniform. I even got a free cup of coffee, too. I dropped in at the high school that day, tracking down some information about the football coach. It was during lunch period, so I went down to the cafeteria looking for him. I asked a couple of the kids if they'd seen him. Everyone gave me the blank stare. Kids can be like that when they think you're treading on their private property. I was cold and a little mad, and I wanted a cup of coffee. Only the coffee line was a mile long. At least that's how it looked to me. I sat down at the table and studied the situation in desperation. When I heard someone say, You look like you could use a cup of coffee. I don't have a priority, or whatever you need. Well, how about taking this? I really don't want it. Well, thanks a lot, but I can get some at the drugstore. No, seriously, I really don't want it. It'll just go to waste. Well... Um, sugar? Uh, one. Uh, no cream. I really appreciate this. Most of the students have been giving me the fishy stare, and, uh... And, uh, what? Well, uh, you're certainly not a student. <laughs> no. I'm in the Women's Army Corps. Have been for quite a few years. Uh, back seeing old places and old familiar faces? No, as a matter of fact, I've never seen this school before. I'm here on an assignment. You see, I work in recruiting. I, I go around to the schools and talk to the students during assembly, tell them what we're doing, what it's like being in the Women's Army Corps, why we need them. The whole story. That's interesting. By the way, my name's Jaffe, Dick Jaffe. I'm a reporter with the Post. Uh, I'm Betty Krupke. 
about this story of yours. Could I hear it? Oh, it's nothing spectacular, Mr. Jaffe. As a matter of fact, you'd probably think it was very ordinary. And again, I might not. I'd like to hear it. I'll even buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> you haven't got a priority. <laughs> well, here's how the story goes, anyhow. Going to war was about the last thing I had in mind back in 1941. I was living with my family in Chicago then, and being the oldest of five girls, I had my hands full 24 hours a day. Pauline was always forgetting where she left her beret. Virginia and Gloria battled constantly over their collection of milk bottle caps. And Carol came home every day from school with scuffed knees and a soiled pinafore. There wasn't much spare time in those days to see what was happening on the other side of our front door. But war doesn't stay on the outside of any door. War walks right into your living room. Like it walked into our living room on that particular Sunday, December 7th, Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Gloria, honey, I, I think you'd better go next door and get Mommy and Daddy. Mrs. Peterson hasn't got a radio. They'll want to know what we've just heard. The next months were crammed with all sorts of new activity. Volunteer organizations, war bond drives. The boys I knew in our neighborhood had left to join the Army or the Air Force. When the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was formed, I thought my chance had come. But... Two years had to pass before I was 21 and able to meet the age requirements at that time. Two long years. And then the week after my 21st birthday. Why exactly do you want to join the WAC, Betty? Well, it's a feeling I can't really put into words, Lieutenant Kenyon. Uh, I've been doing a lot of war work, but, well, I want something more. It's really very hard to explain. Do you think you can adjust yourself to army routine? It isn't easy. Oh, yes, I do. How much time will you require to straighten out your affairs at home? I've had two years already, Lieutenant Kenyon. I won't need any more time. <laughs> oh, they must be kidding. No one gets up at this hour. We do. We've got exactly five minutes to make reveille. After you, Private McCarthy? You'll end up being a sergeant, Private Krupke. I know the type. Okay, let's go. One, two, three, four. Basic training at Daytona Beach. It was November, 1943. And like the lieutenant said, it wasn't easy. The sky was a thin milk gray when Reveille sounded. And the long day that stretched before us was filled with classes, with special training and drilling. In the beginning, you were tired, dead tired, but you didn't talk about it. You didn't have time to talk about it. You were too busy learning the routine of Army life. I learned a lot, and so did my roommate, Marge McCarthy. Another ten years, and maybe I'll get used to all this stuff. Uh, Marge, what are you going to specialize in? Sleeping. Long-distance sleeping. <laughs> what else? Well, I thought I'd let the Army tell me. We'll be through our basic in a few more weeks. I wonder if we'll go overseas. I mean, right from here. Oh, I doubt it. Do you care? I don't know. I hadn't given it much thought. Maybe you better start as of right now. Uh, maybe I should, but I think I'll let it go until morning. Me too. Night, Betty. Night. Overseas. What did you say? He'll keep. Night march. The days, the weeks sped past, and finally, the day we'd all been looking forward to, the day we graduated from basic training. We were all so proud and happy, but there was a certain sadness, too. In the service, something very special and very wonderful happens to you. You meet a lot of new people, and almost overnight you discover that you have a lot of new friends. Friends you'll know for the rest of your life. Friends you work with, who share the same hopes, the same dreams. 
And when you find suddenly that you're leaving them, you realize how much you'll miss them. All of them. Marge and I were both sent to the 3rd Air Force Headquarters in Tampa, Florida to work in the finance office. It was work I knew and liked, and our barracks were very comfortable, except for certain unwelcome intruders. Oh, Scat! Scat! Get off of my bed! Oh, jeez! Hey! I wonder why those darn oh. chickens go straight for your bed when they sneak in our bed. I don't know. But I do wish our neighbors across the road would keep better tabs on their livestock. <laughs> I expect to see one of their cows in here any day. Oh, come on, let's snap into it and get cleaned up. We've got a date. Or have you forgotten? Oh, that's one thing I never forget. Private McCarthy. Drew Field and McDill Field were not too far from our headquarters. And we met a lot of the boys who were training to fly B-17s and B-25s. They were a wonderful bunch, and we had lots of fun. Come on, Betty, let's go outside and soak up some of this Florida moonlight. Huh? All right, Skip. Had a girl. Oh. Gee, Skip, we've had a lot of fun and... And it's almost over. For you and me, anyway. Um, you'll always be careful, won't you, Skip? <laughs> well, just as careful as you can be in the tail of a B-17. Look, kid, don't worry. We're a real good outfit. Great pilots, great navigators, and especially great gunners like yours truly, Skip Harris. <laughs> At your service, man. Oh, Skip, I'm going to do something about this. What are you talking about? You moonstruck? No. I want to do what you're going to do. I want to go overseas. You want to what? Mm. Oh, now, look. You're doing a big job right here. Stay put, baby. No, Skip, I'm not going to stay put. Oh, sure, I know our job is important here, but I think the same job would be doubly important overseas. I'm going to speak to Lieutenant Allen tomorrow. What'd the lieutenant say then? Uh, only that she'd try, Skip. Uh-huh. Look, Betty, if, if you should uh, get overseas... Well, I mean, if, if you and I should meet... And... Maybe London or Paris. Uh, you still owe me a dance. Well, I'll remember. Make sure you do, too. Skip? Yeah? You write to me? You try and stop me. Oh. Come on. Let's go, Don Juan. What's the matter? Is there war on or something? Take care of yourself, Betty. Uh, goodbye, Skip. You take care of yourself, too. Because, well, just in case you don't know it, there is a war going on. And that's how Skip and his outfit moved out to fight. I don't have to tell you I missed him. And I wanted more than ever to get overseas. A few days later, it happened. Special order number 934. Oh, my overseas orders! Yes, I had my wish. My overseas orders. I was glad. But again, I had to say goodbye to many wonderful friends. Gee, kid, what'll I do without you? Oh, don't be silly, Marge. You'll keep on doing your job and having fun, too. None of the other girls are leaving yet, and we'll meet again. I know we will. You're right, Betty. I guess I'm just jealous. Wish I were going with you. Well, soldier girl, good luck. So long. Amzy Strickland featured in the role of Sergeant Betty Kropke in the proudly we hail production When the Clock Strikes. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. Here's a most important message for young women listening to this radio program. If you're between the ages of 18 and 34 and qualify, you can prove that this is a woman's world, too. How? By enlisting in the WAC, Women's Army Corps. By joining right now when you're needed most, and when the opportunities for advancement are greatest, you'll be serving your country well, and yourself, too. You'll have opportunities for some of the finest specialized training in the world, training which will serve you well should you elect to return to civilian life. You'll enjoy the same pay, allowances, medical care, vacations, and opportunities for travel as the men in the services. But most of all, you'll have the inner satisfaction 
of knowing you are serving your country when the need is urgent. So serve as American men serve. Do your part in keeping America strong. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and enlist in the WAC, Women's Army Corps. Do it now. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now we present the second act of When the Clock Strikes. Although my overseas orders had finally come through, I still had a lot of work in front of me before I actually shipped. I was transferred to Fort Oglethorpe for what was called extended field training. This was Daytona Beach all over again, only more so. Again, my life became a scheduled roster, classes, drilling, conditioning to prepare us for assignment overseas. My next stop was Camp Stoneman, just outside of San Francisco. There, I received my overseas shots, and in a few days, we embarked. For 27 days, we steamed across the Pacific and finally put into port at Brisbane, Australia. I was on the other side of the world. Home was a long way off. But the war was very near. You know, Betty, we should be getting our assignments any day now. Oh, you really think so? Mm-hmm. I have a private wire direct to headquarters. <laughs> oh, Francis, <laughs> I hope you're right. I like kangaroos and things, but enough is enough. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Francis, you know... For the first time, I'm really beginning to feel now that, well, that maybe I'm a part of this war. Not a big part, but I'm not on the outside looking in anymore. Uh, well, uh, I just don't want to find myself right smack in the middle of things, that's all. Well, isn't that why you joined the WAC? Let's go see if we can find out any more about our assignments. <laughs> I was finally shipped to Hollandia, Dutch New Guinea, headquarters of all air forces in the Far East. In the many months that followed, I was transferred from place to place, and each time closer and closer to the men who were fighting. We did a strange assortment of jobs, filled all sorts of positions. They all... Switchboard personnel was hard to find, and there was endless correspondence to be typed and filed. But... It was all a part of the pattern of our lives, and we loved it. We were doing us. American women were at war in the wax. The war with Japan was drawing to a close, and I shall never forget the day I stood on the sidelines in Nichols Field outside of Manila when the envoys came to confer with General MacArthur on the terms of surrender. As they stepped out of that plane that had brought them, I felt an overwhelming sense of pride. Against everywhere had headed together and died for this moment. Yes, I felt proud and grateful, too. I had had a chance to play even a small part in... Hey! Oh, hey! What's I've been busy? Going, all the U.S.? Aren't you glad? We, we have the Freddy, do you realize that every single whack contingent in the Far East has gone home but us? It's been so long. So long, I wonder how I'll like. My dear girl, you've been out in the hot sun too long. When I got back to the States, I suddenly felt that I had done my job and... Now I should not only return to my family in Chicago, but to the civilian life I'd left so long ago. Oh, sis, you look wonderful. Oh? Well, I, I feel very strange, Gloria. You mean you don't like that pretty dress? <sighs> not at all. Well, it's lovely, but it, it's been years since I've worn anything but a uniform. Uh, well, I guess it's hard to understand how I feel unless you've been in the Army. <laughs> I'd received my discharge from the wax, and I was told that I had a period of 90 days in which to re-enlist. If I re-enlisted within that time, I could keep my rank and all my rights and benefits. Well, time drifted along, and I was comfortable and happy with my family, but a little disturbed, too. I, I didn't quite know what was bothering me. 
That is, I didn't know until the 90 days had almost passed. Betty, are you going to take me today? Uh, where, Gloria? Well, you remember the parade. Oh, sure, the Army Day Parade. Okay, we'll go, if you want to. Oh, of course I want to. So do I, I guess. Let's go. Oh, gee, Betty, look at all those wax. Oh, gosh, they look terrific. Just like you used to look in your uniform. I stood there with my sister and looked at the soldiers in wax passing by. As the color guard came by, I automatically snapped to attention and almost raised my right arm to salute. I could feel my eyes get wet, my throat catch. And in the next split moment, I knew what had been troubling me. I knew I missed the army. I knew there was only one thing I wanted. I wanted again to be part of that great team that was marching so proudly by. The next day, I re-enlisted. And my first assignment was Washington, D.C., the Pentagon and the War Department. For a couple of months, I was so glad to be back in service, I didn't care what I did or where I was assigned. But once I settled down, I felt the old urge to go overseas. But there were so many girls who wanted overseas service that it took request after request before I got my wish. But finally, my orders came through, and I was sent to General MacArthur's headquarters in Tokyo. Corporal Krupke, you're going to work in the section that handles billeting. Oh, uh, what are you using for billets, Captain? Well, what hotels are available, office buildings, and whatever other structures have heat and light. My job was interesting, and I was sent on temporary duty to many other places to do similar work. The Army of Occupation was well run, and our relationship with the Japanese was very pleasant. I received my quota of leaves and flew to Hong Kong, Shanghai, Paping and many other interesting places. But suddenly, without warning, our pleasant, well-ordered routine was shattered. In June of 1950, war broke out in Korea. Attention! At ease, girls, at ease. I've called this formation to explain exactly what is expected of us. We have a big job ahead. A job that requires longer hours and exacting application. There will be fewer passes and very little leave. Now, it's going to be tough. But is there anyone here who thinks we can't do it? Good. Let's get to work. Sergeant Krupke, take over. Attention! Dismissed! <sighs> what a day, Betty. I'm knocked out. Yeah, I, I guess we all are, Mary, but we're not done yet. What do you mean? Well, today a whole bunch of nurses were flown to Korea. We've got to go to the hospital and pitch in tonight. Who said so? Nobody. Nobody's ordered us to do it, but we're all going. Coming? What do you think? And so the days went. The wax did take over. With the acute shortage of nurses, we did every conceivable kind of job. We wrote letters for the boys, fed and bathed them, changed the beds. We even worked at the rest camps, doing all we could to help the combat-weary men. Uh, Sergeant Krupke? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant, we've been all too busy to say many thank yous, but I want you to know how every one of us is grateful for what you wax have done. I know I speak for everyone here when I say that I only wish we had a few thousand more like you. And that's the story I tell them, Mr. Chaffee. Well, I warned you before I started, it wasn't front-page news. No, it's not front-page news, Betty, but it's important news. Your story... The stories of the other women like you who are serving their country today in the WAC, doing an important job. 
I'd like to see what I can do with it, if you don't mind. Mine? Well, I'd be flattered. Well, we'll all be in there. Your four sisters, the training you went through, Skip, the overseas assignment, your reenlistment, all the little threads which are part of the pattern, the pattern of the Women's Army Corps. Oh, gee. Oh, you know, I should be getting up to the assembly hall now. The bell's going to ring any minute. I'm glad I came down here, Betty. Glad I didn't have a cup of coffee. There's just one question. All right. You've been in the Army about eight years now. You must be approaching the end of your current hitch. Uh, yeah, that's right. In November, my enlistment will be up. Okay, here's a $64 question. You gonna re-enlist? What do you think, Mr. Jaffe? I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amsey Strickland, for a very warm portrayal. And now here's an important message to the young women of America. Here's a brief word about an opportunity you can't afford to miss. Why not get an early start towards a career with the job that gives you the feeling of being of real service to your country? You'll enjoy that feeling in the Women's Army Corps. And you'll be doing a vital job that's a little different every day. In the Women's Army Corps, you'll get the finest specialized training in the world. So don't let this opportunity pass by. Remember, today, young women between 18 and 34 can best serve their nation by working side by side with the men in the services. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and get all the details today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This program featured Amzie Strickland as Sergeant Betty Krupke. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail.